it is 1.30, so I'll got, kind of go ahead and get us started here, and I'm sure we'll have more people signing on as we get started, but to be respectful of everybody's time, we'll get things underway. So for those of you that have joined us, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, that music was from our UK Jazz Ensemble, so if you could hear the music, uh, you can check those guys out. I'm For those of you that I don't know, uh, my name is Elizabeth Vaughn, and I am the Associate Senior Director of Philanthropy for the college, and uh, we're hosting our very first ever Cafe Conversations, um, and so we're excited to have Dean Nancy Cox to kick these off. Uh, Dean Cox is going to give us just a quick overview of some of the ways the college has been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and it is a myriad of ways. So I don't want to take up too much of your time, but if you do have questions for Dean Cox, you can use the chat feature. Again, we're going to try to keep everybody's video and audio turned off during this, just so that it makes it a little bit easier. Um, as you submit the questions via chat, I'll pass those on to Dean Cox. And so without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over. Thank you, Beth, uh, for setting up this meeting. Um, there are so many friends from all walks of life, our alums, our partners, our recent alums as well. And certainly in this audience, there is a wealth of knowledge and successful leadership. Um, we have been working hard in our college to find innovative ways to serve our mission um, during the time of the COVID pandemic. And I'll go just over a few highlights of some of the things we're doing. You should remember um, that we serve the food and ag industry, and therefore we are considered critical infrastructure. We can't take time off during the planting season, the foaling season, the calving season, hay production. That is what we need to help with, and we found good ways to do this. Um, the COVID virus has, I think, taught us two things, two things I hope it's taught us. One is that science is important. Science is really important, especially as we're considering opening things back up. It is very important that elected policymakers have the best information from dedicated scientists to hope to conquer this disease. Science to use or to inform decisions is a guiding principle of the College of Agriculture, Food and Environment. The other thing I hope people learn from this is that we should not take food for granted. We have many more people going hungry now. And for most people living now, this is the first time hamburger and bacon was not on the Kroger shelf. Um, the food supply chain has been greatly affected by the virus. So these two lessons about science and where our food comes from are fundamental to all of our educational efforts at CAFE, and we certainly trust that our graduates will take these lessons seriously in this increasingly complex world. A few other highlights. Um, our college has an emergency operations group that has met every week to identify operational issues associated with all the closings from the virus. We have a coronavirus website to help our faculty, staff, and students. Most of our employees who could transition to remote work in early to mid-March and continue to work um, remotely. Not everybody, though. Um, we have researchers and extension folks that are continuing to manage labs, field, and barns to do research for the crop season, which does not wait for the virus, and um, to be available to our clientele. Our extension offices have more or less um, used the practices of the county they're in, they reside in, for social isolation, but we have still been available to take soil samples, plant samples for disease diagnosis. We have produced over 35,000 brown bag kits for people to take home, and we have advised more and more on home gardens, and we have um, advised on nutrition more and more. Our family and consumer sciences group are partnering with the Commissioner of Agriculture to really step up Victory Gardens. And um, we have um, 
The other thing we've done that's huge is we've transitioned to online teaching after spring break. Our faculty did heroic efforts to transition courses to online. We are also having online summer school. And our college has not traditionally taught a lot of classes in summer school. We have taught more experiential learning during summer. But this summer, we are stepping up to try to do some enhanced summer school offerings so our students can catch up online, or even if they're incoming freshmen from for the fall, can get ahead online. Um, we also are very proud that we have produced hand sanitizer for use by UK Healthcare. That is a collaboration uh, with our partners from Beam Suntory and the James B. Beam Institute. And we are planning now to ramp up to serve the university community in the fall. We are engaging in scenarios now for bringing back students in the fall for maybe some altered mixes of online and, and, and residents and um, maybe some altered terms. But we are talking about that right now. So our college is at the front, of cent front and center of a lot of um, discussions about opening up the university. We also have the Small Business Development Center for Kentucky that's part of the college. And the Small Business Development Center has been working 24 seven to serve our industries, our small businesses in Kentucky with, in terms of loans from the Small Business Administration. So we've been busy, uh, we're still serving, we're serving in a different way. If you think about our research now, we still need to do variety trials. We still need to do trials for our growers of our, of, that are planting right now in corn and small grains. But you can't take a load of graduate students to the field anymore. They each have to ride in one car and they have to social distance. So we are, we are doing these things, we're doing them differently, but we're, we're dedicated to serving um, serving the industries that depend on us. So I'll stop there and then maybe we can transition to questions. Perfect. Thank you, Dean Cox. So you had mentioned that, you know, the college typically provides these experiential learning opportunities. Has the college thought about how we continue offering those experiential components going forward you know, we don't know what the fall semester will look like, so this could be an early question, but one of our participants had submitted this in advance. Yes, um, we, we really depend on experiential learning in the college, and those things range from our dietetics internships, um, our forestry summer camps. Uh, we, we have a lot of um, equine and animal science students who do internships on farms. We are doing the best we can to continue those. And um, we also have accreditation agencies for a lot of these things. So we are going back and forth all the time to see how we can meet the experiential learning piece um, and, and, uh, and keep our students safe. Safety is, is first and foremost. We do have some interns out now that are on farms using social distancing and um, and uh, we're confident that they're getting the best education. But it's a, it's a huge question for a college that depends on real life experiences as much as ours does. Yeah, absolutely. Well, kind of along sort of keeping in that student realm, someone had submitted, you know, some high school seniors around the nation have been sort of indicating they're thinking about a gap year for this coming, you know, fall semester, maybe into the spring. You know, maybe taking that year off. So would you give them any advice or maybe give their parents any advice as they think about that decision? Well, I, that is a really good question. And um, I know that families, especially those, we have a high proportion of students in our college who are from out of state. And I know their parents want them to stay at home and be safe. And um, I, I hope that we might have enough online offerings at the University of Kentucky that the um, that the students could do some online work and stay connected with us. So not only our college, but the whole university is trying to address those issues with, with online offerings. And incidentally, some of the plans for opening up in the fall 
also involves um, maybe being able to go face to face and transition quickly to online. So think about the safety. If people come back in the fall and have a virus outbreak, um, they're going to want to go to online right quick. We're all going to want to do that. So we're trying to do flexible offerings and keep folks connected. Um, it is uh, definitely a work in progress. Our college's admissions, you might be interested to know, are down about 16% right now for this fall. Um, the university at large is down 25% for the fall. So we're hopeful that um, we can hang on to those students who have who've been admitted and accepted and give them what they need to stay connected. We've learned that you can learn a lot online, face-to-face uh, -face is better, but we have to play to the times we're in. Absolutely. Well, you know, one, the other sort of big piece of our mission, I guess two other areas in addition to teaching are research and extension. And so we had a question about research, you know, what's being done to aid researchers in overcoming some of the obstacles, particularly related to conducting field research with these new restrictions? You know, I think specifically there were some questions about, you know, how are we spacing people out? You know, how are we, how are we handling that, that question mark? Yes, with regard to the field research, we probably have more, we have a lot more going on with field research than we do in laboratories right now because we can be six feet apart. We can each drive a truck, if we have the trucks, and we do, to, to the field site. Um, safety does come first. We're doing all the PPE, all the masks, all the sanitation. But, um, and we have had a few problems with our field research because we use students for so much summer research and the students are home. So we probably lost a, a little bit of that wonderful contribution of students this year, um, but we are trying to, to make up for it because we have an obligation. We're funded by the commodity groups and the, the only time we can start that research is, is now and, um, and has been the past month or so. So I feel pretty good about the field research. Um, we, um, we certainly appreciate all of our staff who still work on the crop research farms, who take care of our animal herds every single day and flocks. And um, we have uh, really tried to support those folks as well. It's probably the lab research that's a little bit more hampered because you do have to still do the spacing. Um, many of our grants from the federal government allow some extensions to help the students, for example, finish up their work. Great. We had a, another question submitted about research, and this is not necessarily related to COVID, but um, you know, obviously our faculty do research on tons of different areas. You know, and what is some of that research that you think is maybe the most interesting or some of the most exciting that's happening in the college? Well, we do, we do have such a broad array of research in the college um, from, from the cutting edge that might be in practice 10 or 20 years from now to the actual things on the ground like now, uh, like variety trials and irrigation and things like that. But we have, uh, we have some world-class scientists. We have virologists. We have a faculty member who, who did research and still does research on the little cell receptor that the, virus, the coronavirus attaches to. So they, weren't, they were looking at how it works in the normal cell, but it turns out that's what the coronavirus attaches to. So there's something that we can, we can parlay. And the University of Kentucky has a lot of research going on now centered in the medical school about the virus. Um, we also do um, advanced technologies like drones, and we've got a researcher now with funding to do um, drone research with cattle and, believe it or not, actually determine which cattle are which by their facial characteristics. So that is, that is not done yet, but it's being done. Um, if many people have heard of the microbiome, that means the bacteria that reside in us which really control a lot of our metabolism and our health. We have researchers who, we have a new researcher who works in that area, just fascinating. So 
your bacteria are controlling a lot more than you think. And so that research lends itself to all kinds of health applications, not just in humans, but um, in broodmares that lose their baby, they can do microbiome work on that and maybe see why. So um, a lot of high tech, exciting stuff. Um, we do a lot of research on, on food and food security and um, we cover the waterfront. Um, of course, we do a lot on animal science too to produce better animals. We do ag econ research. So it goes on and on and it is, it is just a pleasure to, to see what all our faculty do. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna shift gears again a little bit here into extension. Um, and I think someone had asked, you know, extension has been around for a very long time and they asked, Basically, is extension still a relevant program? Is that something we should still be doing? You know, um, I get that question a lot from people that I work for at UK who don't have a background in extension. And um, certainly extension has evolved. It was created more to be a farmer's uh, helpmate, and it still is. Um, I like to say that we extension is responsible for a safe, abundant and cheap or inexpensive food supply. We do that every year, year after year. Um, another thing to remember is that other than a few counties, most of Kentucky's counties are very rural and the extension office is almost the best meeting place, almost always the best meeting place in a county. And I think during the COVID um, crisis, We've gotten more clientele than we had before for some of our programs in nutrition and health. Um, I'm very excited that um, um, our family and consumer science side of the Extension House has partnerships with UK Healthcare, the nursing schools, Barnstable Brown Diabetes Center, Public Health. We are grasping the opportunity to be the kind of locus for bringing in different expertise, experts to, to help with health in Kentucky. Um, we, um, um, for the Western grain region, we are critical to the economy. Our agents are critical to the economy. So I would say um, I'm pretty proud of Extension and would put Kentucky's relevance up against any other state as to as to how we're trying to evolve and serve the state. Yeah, absolutely. We had someone had sort of submitted the opposite side of the question of they said they've never seen FCS skills be more necessary. And so I think you know you talked a little bit to that one as well there. You know, one of the things we've seen a lot in the news, you know, in the last few weeks is how this it's impacted UK from a budgetary standpoint and you know obviously it's not been a positive impact you know I forget I want to say 70 million is the shortfall that UK is predicting for this coming academic year and so obviously that impacts extension and so we had several questions asked about how would this budget you know shortfall affect extension extension for those of you on the call that don't know extension is in the process of revamping how they are structured and we're bringing on some new staff members. So Dean Cox, would you mind to talk a little bit about how the budget issues are maybe affecting all of that? Right, and um, thanks for the introduction of the, the, the efforts we've put forth in the last few years to reorganize extension from an operational standpoint, um, mostly an operational standpoint because we, we know we're good at serving, but we, were, we felt we were organized um, in a way that we weren't enough financially accountable enough and that we didn't have the appropriate supervisory ratios. So in the midst of this budget cut, uh, effective budget cut that we've had because of the COVID crisis, we were, in, we were in the process of trying to hire a bunch more extension administrators. And um, I've always said, one of the things, if you're a dean, you never want to add administration, but we are, we are not only adding it, we're convinced we need to add it, um, it's going to slow us down a little bit, but um, we will we will get there. Um, the budget cuts um, from the university were passed on 
not disproportionately, but passed on in a proportionate way to extension. Um, we, that we enjoy um, the support of counties and the federal government in addition to the state. So we hope to have some options there, although we're expecting counties may similarly be challenged going forward in their ability to support extension. Yeah. Kind of in looking at some more maybe broader issues, can someone had asked that you talk a little bit about CAFE's involvement in food security issues. I know this has been another issue that's been in the news. And so, and I know we have different areas of the college involved in this, but could you share a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Um, I'll start with our, with our students in, led by the dietetics and human nutrition department. Our students created something called a campus kitchen, which repurposed excess food. And it rapidly became the number one campus kitchen out of about 50 in the United States. We also have a hunger minor within our curriculum in dietetics and human nutrition. We're also a member of the President's United to Solve Hunger organization. And we were to have hosted the um, event, the worldwide event this spring, but we had to uh, put it online in a smaller scale. So we have that core of commitment that our students in CAFE typically have. We also have, through extension, a lot of leadership in that we both run the food stamp education program, which is called SNAP Ed, and the expanded food and nutrition education program, which are different but similar things that we run out of extension. We've got over a couple of hundred people out in the state helping families stretch their food dollar and try to uh, try to create healthy meals. So we are heavily invested in. Um, in food security um, within our programs. And um, never has that been more important, I think, in our lifetimes than right now. We've also, through extension, been involved with a lot of uh, meals that were delivered to people that needed them and coordinating all that. So we're kind of front and center in the community through extension. And then we have that spirit within our students as well. Great. Well, we had had another question submitted, kind of jumping back to extension a little bit. That you know, some of the new programs, or maybe some programs have been um, maybe retrofitted is the right word to be online through extension now. And so, instead of having specialists maybe out in the counties to present a program, they're doing it all virtually. At some point, hopefully, this pandemic ends and we're allowed to get out and about again. And so when that happens, do you see those programs still being delivered online or do you see specialists back in the counties, you know, delivering them in person? Probably a mix, but I think most people do believe we'll shift to more online. And I heard an agent last week say, this online, this necessity to go online has helped us reach more people because the, the 30 to 40 year olds who have kids at home they can't come to an extension office for a program at night and still get homework done and everything else. But they can pick up their iPhone wherever they are, whenever they're ready, and get programmed. So I think it actually pushed us over into becoming more relevant to more folks. And I think our agents throughout the state report that they have more followers now than they did before. So that is certainly a, a silver lining for us. And of course, you reach more people too. Then one-on-one, -on -one, you, you reach a lot more people if you're able to to put it online. So we put a lot of trainings online. Absolutely. Well, I know we hear lots and lots of negative coming out of this pandemic, but I think that is a great positive that you know we've really been able to reach a lot of people through this. So it's sometimes nice to hear the positives from this. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of questions, just kind of thinking about the future of the college and. You know, one of, obviously, I'm always interested in the philanthropy side, working on this side. And so we had a question submitted, in five years, where do you see the big need for philanthropic dollars in the college? Well, um, so people, most, most in the audience, but not all, might realize that our college did a strategic plan about five years ago. And the one imperative we, we identified 
that we really needed to flourish was more buildings. We have not had a new building in our college since 2001, and that's the Plant Sciences Building. And so one of my, I call it my holy grail, since I've been the dean, is to try to advance us to a situation where we have more buildings. We've had some progress, but we were kind of on the verge of putting together a coalition for a classroom building. And now that is, that is not on the front burner at all because of our, our funding sources. So I think that the facilities um, for our college are still important. Um, certainly scholarships have, are always important and, and even more important now. But I think really finding a way to have our facilities reflect the quality of our students and the quality of our faculty would be really important. Um, one example is we've in these plans for opening up in the fall, people say, well, we have to have classrooms where we can distance. Well, we don't have we don't have classrooms in which we can distance because we don't have very many large classrooms. So so we really were we really are on the edge of for greatness needing some some better classrooms as well as other facilities. We think we're still on the list for the USDA Agricultural Research Service research building for forage and animal, but that, that doesn't do the teaching. Yeah. Well, I guess in general, you know, when you think about the college, you know, there's all, there's, as we've said, there's research, there's teaching, there's extension, there's all sorts of things happening. But when you think about the future of this college, what gets you really excited? Um, that, that we always need food 365, 24 seven, and that people will even know that more now. And we will always have challenges with the environment. We'll have to be increasingly challenges with water utilization. And uh, we will have um, the rural urban divide problems going forward. And um, so I think, especially in Kentucky, we still have so much rural landscape. I think we can have a viable food production system. Um, many people think right now we're going to go to a lot more local food sourcing. If you think about what's happening now with the large slaughter plants, they're so large and they're so vulnerable and so fragile to this disease. So it is thought that a transition uh, might go to, to more locally produced food, which will cost more, but it might be it might be possible going forward. So Kentucky's still such a rural state. We might be the new Silicon Valley for clean water, forests, and forage. Um, so I think we can think that big. Yeah, that's as someone who loves to eat. That makes me very excited. I know. Not to mention the bourbon industry, which which is a definitely um, definitely an important farming industry as well. Absolutely. Well. One of our questions was, how could alumni get more engaged with the college if they were interested in that? Well, that's a great question, and thanks for whoever asked. Um, part, partly, I would turn it around and say, you tell me how you want to be engaged, and we'll make it happen. But um, other universities have had things like mentorship programs where we pair an alum with a student, and um, they converse back and forth. and. Um, that can work really well. So people that are in the functioning well in the real world, I think our students always appreciate that contact. And um, as far as the, that goes, we, we're thinking about, I should have said earlier, this is an experiment today, but we're thinking about offering more of these Zoom sessions on things like the James B. Beam Institute or using drones to check on cattle faces and things like that. So, or the local food movement and what we could do. So um, I would hope we get some responses about whether this worked and, and what might work better. But I am, uh, again, so thankful for all the alums that are on this call today. Well, fantastic. Well, one of the questions that we've had submitted here is, you know, as students, we, I should say, we just had students graduate, you know, that's, they may not have had the big celebration and ceremony, but they did complete their degrees. And you know, now some of them, some of them were fortunate enough to have had jobs lined up before graduation, but some of them are now searching for jobs. Can you talk a little bit to how the college helps our students find jobs as they prepare for graduation? 
Yeah, helping find helping with finding jobs is, has never been more important. We have a good record of that. We also have the Stuckert Career Center, and certainly everybody's doubling down now to try to help students find jobs. Um, in uh, one of the best ways uh, for students to find a job is to intern with a particular concern or company. Uh, and we're still reaping the benefits from some of those things. We have some fantastic um, students working in really large agribusiness industries and, and other places. But um, it is real important to, to help students now because they're not as much hiring but if we if we have the relationship with companies and if, if by luck the student had to, were able to do an internship, that helps a whole lot. But we need to be a lot more intentional. But our college has every student has some kind of experiential piece to their degree, so hopefully that allows them to get a feel for the for the job world out there. Absolutely. Well, we've had a question submitted about the bourbon industry in particular. And for those of you on the call that maybe not are not aware of this, in February, before we were, or back when we were allowed to all be in the same room, we hosted the first ever James B. Beam Institute uh, Industry Conference and brought a lot of people in the bourbon industry to campus. Uh, and it was really successful. And so they've asked about, this person has asked about, are there plans for the college to continue engaging and growing opportunities in the bourbon industry. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the the partnership with Beam Suntory is is so great because we realize we share a lot of the same philosophies about clean water, air, jobs, um, that kind of thing. Um, and the the institute was set up to be open, to not be owned proprietarily by Beam Suntory, but to allow a pathway for others to come in. And that industry conference certainly reflected that because we had a lot of the Kentucky spirits industry in the room with us. So we, uh, we already have about 300 students in a certificate program. We are trying to move, um, move that to some graduate programs. And the doors are open for further collaborations with the industry. And it's, uh, it's gotten off to a good start. And um, again, appreciate the openness of Beam Suntory for wanting to be inclusive of the whole industry. The rising, rising tide lifting the boats thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that looks like all the questions we have had submitted, um, you know, I, Dean Cox, I don't know if you have any closing or final thoughts that you want to share with the group. Well, um, I, I guess the, so there are no more from the floor or anything like that. I'm not seeing any more. Okay. Unless anybody has any more, go ahead and submit those. Well, I, you know, my, my, my biggest hope is that this was helpful to our alums and friends to kind of see what challenges are quote unquote business has because it is a business in a lot of ways and um, any ideas on the things we've shared and how to do things any better we would, we would sure appreciate. We would love to keep you all engaged in a, in a format that you would enjoy. We would be interested in how often we might want to do Zoom conferences like this, what topics you might enjoy hearing about. Um, our college has, it's so vast and, and broad and we have so many stories. We always tell students we have something for everyone. And so I hope um, I hope you all would would think a little bit about what might be relevant and important to you to hear from us next. We we can you know hear from the Bourbon Institute, other other cool programs. We did have one last question submitted asking about could you elaborate on the SNAP Ed program and what that is? Yes, um, the SNAP Ed program. So the, the SNAP program is Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. SNAP. It's the new. It's the new word for food stamps. So it's food stamps is SNAP, and SNAP Ed is a government program funded by USDA that puts extension folks and extension associates out in the communities to try to educate the families about what kind of food 
they can buy with their food dollar, they should buy for stretching it before they how to prepare it. Um, it is community based and I think very powerful because of that. But um, that is, so it's SNAP education, it's funded by the federal government. Um, there are a lot of um, um, increases possible right now in that funding as well. But it's our, um, so we hire folks that work out of extension offices and they are very, very involved with individuals and helping them to feed their families. That's fantastic. Well, um, you know, again, I appreciate your time today, Dean Cox, and everybody, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will send out an email to all of our participants following this with a link to the recording, um, so if they want to share it or if you missed something, you'll have that available. Uh, and then also, we'll have some opportunities for you to provide feedback. So if there are topics that you want to hear more information on, we have planned another one of these cafe conversations for June 4th. We've asked some of our Ag Econ faculty to join us to talk about the impact of COVID-19, really specifically on the agriculture economy. And we obviously are getting lots of news reports of the broader economy, but we wanted to drill down a little bit more to specific to the agricultural uh, industries and then also to the state of Kentucky and what that looks like in our state. Um, so watch your emails for more information on how to register for that one. And again, thank you guys so much and have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone.